I'm here in Berlin uh, talking to Brett Scott um, yeah. on the podcast. If you don't know Brett Scott, um, Brett Scott was like one of the first people I think that I had on the podcast. That I was like, uh, I was like fanboying really hard whenever I was like, when oh my was gosh, that? It was like 20, uh, 20 or 2020, 2020 or 2021. I think 2020 because okay. it was fairly early. It was during, I remember it was during the pandemic. But um, yeah, I mean, you're known for being like, uh, at least for me, like one of the, you know, one of those very good writers when it comes to money from a left wing perspective. And it also like um, had a lot of space for writing about cryptocurrency. So I think you're also mm-hmm. for a long time, like one of the few people that were writing about cryptocurrency to any extent from a more kind of like progressive sure, yeah, point yeah. of view, um, which is very difficult for me to because I remember before I started the podcast, I was like, no one's doing it until like I found like a I think maybe a talk by you uh, mm-hmm. at one point about it. Um, I was like, oh, he did, he wrote, like this guy wrote something that was like, um, I don't know, the only kind of other things were maybe like very academic or just like very, um, like hypercritical in a way that, that I just like didn't resonate with. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I used to try and yeah. go and like hang out in the Bitcoin scene a lot and explore it. I have like an anthropological impulse. So even when I sense there's like a political dynamic that I don't necessarily resonate fully with, I still like to immerse myself in the scene. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, see what people are experiencing. Um, yeah, so like early Bitcoin, I used to like hang around a lot in that crew, explored it a lot, wrote pieces about it and stuff. And at a time when a lot of other left wing people, I guess, tend at least at least in the left wing intelligentsia, mm-hmm. would tend to just reject stuff. Yeah, kind of dismiss yeah. it. Yeah. Not not all, but you know, quite. There's a, there's a sure, significant sure. tendency. Yeah. Um, but so from from what I remember um, from talking to you before is that you were involved in a lot of the Bitcoin stuff in in the UK, um, and from what I understood you at one point whenever there was like the split the the block wars uh, between like Bitcoin and and Bitcoin Cash. Um, actually, I was wondering, I was curious to hear about like uh, as a veteran of the block wars <laughs> and like and 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 that split. Did you have any thoughts? I think um, when I look at it, uh, there is something to say. I think both sides were kind of silly anyways but there was something there's a certain veneer of like uh it was like the a point of like clash between like the two narratives yeah of of bitcoin of bitcoin being cash or bitcoin being digital gold yeah yeah i mean i wasn't heavily invested in that debate bear in mind i mean you know stuff like cryptocurrency was a sort of fairly small part of my overall work. Sure. My overall work has always been about the politics of finance more generally. I mean, I worked in the financial sector and stuff like that. So, you know, one of the reasons I was exploring stuff like Bitcoin is that I was exploring alternative finance and alternative money more generally. Mm-hmm. So, and I would see Bitcoin as like one small subset of that topic. Um, so I wasn't like 100% immersed in it. I mean, if you're sure, 100% sure. immersed in a topic, then small deviations seem like these giant momentous events so people Mm. in the bitcoin scene like stuff like the bitcoin cash split was this like epic like battle and stuff (laughs) to me it was a sort of like small marginal difference of disagreement between people who basically agree with each other on some stuff right 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 um but because i was doing work on physical cash and the promotion the protection of physical cash and the normal monetary system people in, in the bitcoin cash scene sort of to some extent, saw me as a potential ally mm. in their attempt to say, you know, like Bitcoin should be this cash like instrument to be used for commerce rather than this speculative object to be used for, you know, hoarding. Right. 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 So I was taken along to the, the first big Bitcoin cash international meeting which they called satoshi's vision and it was in japan (laughs) you went uh, to japan yeah yeah roger veer you know uh and his crew got me there (laughs) i mean i don't know if he personally really cared that much for my work but like he had to sign the letter to get the japanese visa right okay uh so you know so i was brought in uh, to try and give maybe they thought i was going to give maybe ideological support uh-huh. for their bid to be seen as the most cash-like instrument 
uh-huh. or the sort of true Bitcoin. But I, again, I wasn't particularly vested in that debate. Uh-huh. I, to some extent, would see both Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin as suffering from many of the same flaws. Albeit, mm-hmm. I actually resonated more with the Bitcoin Cash community in the sense that I, I kind of appreciated what they were at least theoretically trying to do. Right, right. Yeah. So, but yeah, you know, I don't. I wasn't like a heavy, a heavy participant <laughs> no, in the not, block. Not wars. saying that necessarily. <laughs> it's just yeah, but I mean, socially, very interesting seeing Being that. Part of the history. <laughs> you know, and going back to this kind of like anthropological stuff. I mean, for me, I have an anthropology background and hanging out in you know, places with all these like hardline libertarian seasteader types who are like. Mm. <laughs> desperately wanted to believe that the world could be run using Bitcoin Cash. I mean, it's like, it was very interesting. Slightly sad sometimes as well, you know, seeing yeah. um, people's beliefs or des- desperately hoping for something to change in the world. And mm-hmm. um, yeah, I'm sure you know there's lots of kind of like quasi-religious elements in the, yeah, yeah. the crypto world. So, for sure, for sure. Um, um, I mean, there are religious elements to capital. <laughs> for sure, I think I would. <laughs> but I mean, I, I suppose the, the the whole Bitcoin but, yeah. Cash versus Bitcoin thing is very interesting because you I mean Roger Veer was originally considered, you know, Bitcoin Jesus, right, right, yeah. in the original community, and then he kind of became this like charlatan Judas to the, the original <laughs> Bitcoiners, and then he became a prophet for a new breakaway, and the, they're all trying to like gain legitimacy by pointing to the white paper and uh-huh. like claiming that they. It so it became very like religious wars. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah. now he's now I don't I have no idea where he is or what he does. Yeah. Or, well, that community then splits into a bunch of other communities. It was like, okay, yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, my most enduring memory of the bit, the first Bitcoin Cash conference was Craig Wright coming to do his big mm. keynote address to an opening song of Metallica Enter Sandman, where he ran, <laughs> he ran down the, the sort of like aisle to the to the stage with this Enter Sandman playing uh-huh. and then kind of like jumped on and then was like waiting for the music to be turned off and like sort of like standing there while people try to, <laughs> to, people try to figure out how to turn the music off. <laughs> I hope that's recorded. <laughs> oh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think so like one of the things, um, so it is very interesting that you, I think, a kind of a rare breed of someone who is like willing to enter into kind of like intellectually trespass into other types of political ideological dominated spaces i guess including the bitcoin one um as like part of your research in in money kind of um generally um but i was interested to know more about like why what is your interest in in money comes from and um yeah how you got to to this point too yeah sure it, you're, you're like a, a metaphor master of of money <laughs> <laughs> yeah i use i have to use metaphors because that's like how my brain works i have to try and ex- i have to try and explain stuff to myself through metaphors yeah. uh but yeah money i think mean, i probably a few different uh routes to becoming interested in money uh first one is like i come from a anthropology background uh, and anthropology actually has a much deeper tra- tradition of thinking about money than economics does, largely because anthropology, you know, if you think about the sort of colonial times when anthropologists were first emerging, they were often connected to colonial exploration, right? So you'd mm-hmm. be sent out to places that basically were not capitalist economies, mm-hmm. all right? Uh, so you're coming from some capitalist country and you're going out to somewhere that doesn't necessarily share your same perceptions in the world and often has very different economic structures. So from the very beginning, anthropology has had this engagement with non-capitalist or pre-capitalist societies, or at least societies that are only partially integrated into capitalism. Mm. Uh, There's lots of problems with early anthropology, lots of ethnocentrism and and so on, but there's still the strong tradition in anthropology of not assuming that market economies are the norm. Mm. Right. Whereas in economics, they tend to just assume from the very beginning that market economies are sort of universal in the default mode of human operation. Sure. And that makes a big difference to how you then analyze money. So economists tend to just assume away a bunch of stuff. They've got these very crude ideas of money that emerge from their underlying assumptions. Whereas anthropologists have had to grapple more with, you know, different forms of money, non-monetary exchange, even stuff, for example, like shell money, which is often 
you know, if you hang around the crypto scenes, you'll constantly people find people like talking about shell money and stuff, or like the the stone money of the island of Yap. Right. All right. And they'll but they'll often apply a highly marketized way of thinking about these things. Whereas an anthropologist would often uh, for example, like David Graeber, you know, there's many anthropologists who would actually, you know, look at how these types of money operate in their own context. And for example, stuff like shell money wouldn't be used for commerce. It will be used for stuff that actually like normal money can't buy, like calling up the spirits of the dead or mm. compensating them, somebody for insulting their honor. You know, mm. these types of things, which you wouldn't ordinarily be able to pay somebody for. All mm. right. Uh, so there's very lo lots of differences. So anthropologists have a lot more interest in that kind of stuff. So and I come from that background. But then I also actually worked in finance and in sort of high finance, uh, partly as a kind of experimental adventure mm -hmm. to kind of immerse myself in that world. And one of the shocking things in high finance or mainstream finance is just how little people understand about the monetary system. Like people who work in high Yeah, finance. yeah. And that's what that was really fascinating that actually you really didn't need to know anything about the monetary system in order to do highly complex financial instruments. Mm. Actually, most traders and stuff have very crude ideas of what the monetary system is. Mm. They don't, they're not required to know because of all these specialist tasks that they, you just assume that money works. Right. Um, and actually, that was became very interesting. So I learned a bunch about, you know, sort of high finance stuff, but no actual, when I was working in finance, very little stuff about the actual monetary system. So I, I started to delve more into that. Um, and then also became in, became involved in alternative finance and alternative monies, um, actually prior to the crypto world. So stuff like mutual credit systems, local currencies and things like that. And if you engage with those systems, you're also forced to engage with yeah, money more generally. So yeah, I guess these are d different okay. routes I've taken to uh, exploring money. And then more recently, I've specialized to some extent, at least in my public life and being a defender of the physical cash system. Um, and that often requires having to build out a bunch of ways to describe money and stuff so people can understand the politics. And mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a uh, yeah, that's yeah. A, and also, you know, money holds the entire capitalist system together. So it's quite a useful thing to to explore if you want to try and understand mm. capitalism more generally yeah i want to get into that but first i kind of want to ask talk a bit about like uh, to me it seems like actually anthropology is like a good kind of um maybe like uh academic practice in order to like analyze contradiction yeah. in, in many ways and like i think a lot of a lot of your work uh, and you've said this before, I can't remember where, but you talked about how you suggested people to be more comfortable with contradiction or to be able to like learn how to live with contradiction rather than necessarily like, mm. I don't know, dismissing things because of a contradiction. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I imagine you probably come across that a lot um, because this, a lot of your work on like the war on cash about protecting the physical cash system, uh, it attracts a lot of people on the right or there are people on the ideological right who would say similar things um yeah, but then yeah. kind of like veer off into like a right-wing politics sure yeah, yeah um how do you kind of deal with these contradictions in the in the money yeah space? i mean I, I this would probably have, to have a whole con discussion by itself but yeah there's a strong tendency at least in i guess like maybe western standard philosophy um of seeking non-contradiction mm. <laughs> uh, or sort of these kind of pure views of the world. Um, I have quite a strong existentialist kind of vibe and an, maybe an, an existentialist tradition is, there is more grappling with the fundamental contradictions of existence. Mm. You know, like for example, you perceive yourself as an individual and yet you cannot survive without other people. You know, that's like a contradiction in itself, right? So right. all these angsty discussions about whether a person's an individual or not, there isn't really an answer, right? You're kind of like both. <laughs> so, right. you know, and it's kind of a bit pointless trying to search for the answer, right? Mm -hmm. These things don't, the, the, the belief that there are these either or things, like are we selfish or altruistic? I mean, these, these, these questions are slightly pointless right, right. Right, to me. Yeah. Um, we're many different things at once, right? And I think... Uh, that is actually something that you do find also echoed in anthropology, at least in sort of more modern anthropology, um, to some extent, which is 
partly comes from encounters with people who have the same emotional and um, genetic makeup as yourself and yet mm. hold very different ways of being in the world. Not only different like views on the world, but also entirely different like practices and stuff. Mm. All right. Um, so at some level, there's a there's a core like shared humanity in the world in the sense that we all are these creatures on a planet trying to survive. Um, and we all share the same sort of angst to some extent. Um, but then we've got very different ways of expressing it, right? So um, I do I do think that our political discussions would be a lot more interesting if we accepted that basic starting point mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, all human beings at some level are, sh are sharing in some common experience, but then have totally different strategies and means of, of uh, making sense of that. So when I'm... You know, even I've even I even try to like not say, you know, like right wing person or left wing person. Sure, sure, yeah. I'll, I'll try to say stuff like person <laughs> who has these tendencies yeah. that we we call right wing. You know, so, so because a, a, right. a human being is like not defined by you know their political beliefs right like they and they can channel different political beliefs at different times so many people yeah. that you currently call right wing are actually just people who happen to be an influence in a particular direction or happen to be emphasizing a, per, a certain part of themselves but that's not the only part of themselves right there's many other parts of themselves right yeah. um that we actually share so i think that's important in politics is to just recognize that you know, even the obnoxious, like anarcho-capitalist, like racist guy at the Bitcoin Cash meetup who tells me that, like, you know, you know like white people should be the um, are, are the only like sh should be like the gods of the world. I mean, these people, this, 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 this guy, like, she would say stuff like that. Right. I still have to try and bear in mind. It's like there's some reason and some context that he's formed this belief in. Right, right, right. I don't understand it personally. I don't have any emotional access to it, but to him, it somehow makes sense. And I don't quite know how it makes sense, but it's like something I could try try to uncover and try to work out and try to sort of um, figure out. And that sort of helps me to maybe be in different ideological scenes at different times. I also come from South Africa, which has got a lot of like crazy stuff going down. So mm -hmm. in South Africa, you kind of have to be to some extent like... Um, open to the fact that people <laughs> have crazy beliefs <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's just like one yeah it, it, to me it's it's almost like uh, uh i don't know like <laughs> keeping keeping in mind that you're talking to a human who has like like the reason that they are speaking in a certain way is because they have some sort of experience that has led them to believe that um rather than kind of like i think when that's forgotten you end up treating that person as like an object disconnected sure, in, yeah, in yeah. existence um and there's also sorry no go ahead there's also like a terrible bias in modern thought of imagining that people come to ideas through rationality right. which is just like a kind of an absurd belief right right <laughs> to, you're not, you're not me, along with the rationalists <laughs> to me it's just like people and i don't mean that we don't have rationality it is maybe like an element of our being we do have mm -hmm. ability to, to rationally abstract thought but like the, the reason why certain ideas resonate with us is that they they emotionally resonate all right mm -hmm. and often like right, right. battles of ideas are sort of proxy warfare it's like a proxy way of, of like emotions battling mm -hmm. um this is also why i'm not always that interested in sort of pedantic accuracy right, right? because I mean, you can rock up in an academic department or like the, the world's best universities and you'll find extremely smart people who have exactly the same information who will come to totally different positions to each other, mm -hmm. all right? right. Um, so there's no, there's no sort of, um, even the world's most, you know, intelligent people will disagree, which, yeah. you know, and, and the reason why they'll disagree is precisely because they got different emotional and political impulses, all right, that they're going to use to sort of curate their... The information in the world um and i think you got to take that seriously and try to sort of meet people there all right mm -hmm. um and yeah so that's the kind of vibe i I'll have you know? <laughs> yeah that's fair i mean definitely if i think at least if i think about myself like for sure my politics is obviously like going to be heavily uh influenced by my personal experience and like i'm going to read things through yeah. the lens of yeah. that so like i can't you know um i I'm, i can't like think of myself as like some uh, i don't know like a completely logical computer that has like found uh, sure, the exactly. answer uh, and even if you had found the answer nobody would actually necessarily care 
because right. you know if, if you went to, if, really if, if, if you went to everybody <laughs> and you say I have discovered the ultimate truth, they would look at it. They'd <laughs> be like, off. they'd be like, oh yeah, I, well there's there's, a, there's actually a different one there. I kind of prefer, you know. And again, not That's that you should, we should give up the attempt of of trying to have integrity and in thought, but uh -huh. I think it's a bit of an illusion to imagine that like stuff that makes sense to you. Yeah. should necessarily make sense to everybody else because the reason why something would make sense to you is it's sort of like you know it aligns to some kind of experience and emotions that you you yourself only have probably or you and a shared group of people but it's you can't assume that somehow everybody else should mm. <laughs> should resonate with that same thing and that's what you know that's what the hard thing of dealing with like you know for example far right people and stuff like that it's like okay like what's going on here like what's the uh, what experience are they having of the world that this stuff makes so much sense, mm. you know, to them? Um, and same for all the political groups. Yeah, sure. I think I, I liked what you said earlier because we were on the panel uh, for Circles uh, Entropy a few days ago and they were kind of looking, I think the phrase like putting privacy in by default. Kind yeah, of like yeah. thing that he said and then I think you mentioned you said like contra putting contradiction yeah, as a yeah, default yeah. and social. yeah I was I was asked on this other podcast like if you had one political wish and you were kind of like you could have it fulfilled what would it be and I, I actually just said um I would love to see everybody appreciate contradiction mm. because I think it would help so many things right you'd um in terms of like having productive debates about how to solve global problems mm -hmm. you know if people had some basic appreciation that like there are fundamental contradictions in the world that can't be resolved and this is going to probably express itself in conflicting thoughts we'd probably be a lot more empathetic towards each other all right mm -hmm. and probably more prepared to work together all right it's the sort of the absolutist types of positions or the assumption that there's universal things that, that tends to make politics really really hard Right. Is that, do you think that has to do maybe as well with like the, I mean, particularly just the things that you are advocating for that just happens to be a lot of like more right leaning tended people. Uh, and so then you have to kind of like, yeah, in what, order for uh, you to like put forth. Yeah. And a lot of, a lot of my work that I do, I, I'm forced to engage a lot with people on the right. Um, this includes money more generally. There's a long tradition. If you're looking at monetary systems of people who will, come from the right who also are concerned about monetary systems right. often for different reasons um but they will they will turn up at my events they'll mm -hmm. you know tell me things that like you know the reason why we're all screwed is because there's fractional reserve banking and that the rockefellers are behind it for example <laughs> um Whereas from a left-wing perspective, you might say, well, the banking sector is an extension of like corporate capitalism and its shareholders, right? Which mm -hmm. are like pension funds, mm -hmm. right? You might have actually similar critiques of something, but you come at from very different perspectives. Um, but spe specifically more recently in the realm of like, I'm doing defense of the cash system. There's a quite a strong contingent of, um, I come at it from, I have a very left-wing position on why we should defend cash. But there's a very strong contingent of of right wing thinkers now who've taken it on as part of their kind of suite of ideas, right? Because you know that you know a lot of these a lot of political groups work with, um, they, they kind of curate issues into bundles. Yeah. So yeah. it's like if you're a right wing, yeah. if you want to signal that you're part of a particular political group, you've got to be like anti woke. You've got to be like anti cbdc plus right. you got to be anti like <laughs> vaccines and so you there's this whole kind of like series of things that they'll kind of curate as being sort of a part of a bundle that you take on yeah. and being pro cash has been included in the current right wing bundle uh -huh. um i'm trying to get it included into the left wing bundle as well right, right. Uh, but it's a bit of a you know, it takes <laughs> takes a while if you had to what, what kind of bundle do you think uh pro cash pro like uh i feel like urbanism would go well with that i don't know <laughs> yeah there's actually different bundles you can have like in the centrist bundle you can actually you can also insert a pro cash position into a centrist bundle it's quite tricky to do it but uh a lot of my arguments for the defense of cash right now for centrists involve talking about balances of power mm. right you need to keep a balance of power in the monetary system and one of the ways to do that is to keep physical money um and actually centrists resonate with that message a lot mm. right because it doesn't involve having to throw out you know digital right, right. which is politically unassailable for the sort of, sort of standard kind of mainstream person 
Um, so, <laughs> you know, that's how you that's how you, you try to include um, into the centrist stuff and the sort of left wing camp, the, the, the at least the more kind of radical left camp. The cash position is anti corporate; it's pro public. So mm. that's a way of doing it. In the right wing camp, it's all about like, you know protecting real money from the sort of like clutches money of the, di- the, the digital yeah. state there's mm-hmm. a lot of contradictions in the right wing position actually and it's it's quite interesting to sort of engage with that um mm-hmm. so yeah cash I think is like interesting- by, by by advocating for a cash system you're able to open a door for them i feel like to like yeah invite them into your mind palace <laughs> yeah yeah a lot of my work right so now can- on and this is my book cloud money was all about uh, the original title of Cloud Money was for the hardback cover was um, the subtitle was Cash Cards, Crypto and the War for Our Wallets. But for the paperback, they actually changed it to Why the War on Cash Endangers Our Freedom, mm. which is actually quite a, let's say, a sort of a libertarian right way, right wing style yeah. of language, actually. Yeah. Um, and what's quite interesting in the current version of Cloud Money or the, paper, the paperback version is that actually on the front cover, I've got an endorsement from Yanis Varoufakis and Kate Rayworth, right. who are both like Lefty, left, left-wing yeah. thinkers. But then I've got this very like coded right-wing yeah, sort of yeah. uh, like subtitle. And I'm, I'm kind of intrigued at like how those two interact with each other yeah. when the sort of like lefty looks at it and then, and then the sort of person who's... Or you know, and so I'm 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 finding it interesting sort of engaging in this debate with uh, different political groups. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, no, I mean, yeah, I took, I tried to take a similar thing uh, with, with my book. <laughs> the subtitles, I guess, is a bit more you know, how capitalism ruined crypto, how to fix it. So like, yeah, you yeah. know, if you're a, a the average person in crypto, you're. I mean, I guess in this particular moment, it's like we are in a bit in a bear market and there has been like a pretty big decrease in interest and like um capital flowing in yeah so i think a lot of people who like still really believe it like i think they're it's a chance to kind of like help them question their ideas yeah, about interesting capitalism. yeah you probably it's probably quite a and good then I put time italic at the top um, yeah like uh yeah yeah Sorry. very cool <laughs> yeah that's interesting actually that's why i was uh, thinking similarly to try and invite people into my mind palace <laughs> yeah to be like okay you're having a moment of reflection or something and he has an alternative take. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah that's cool. Um, but so, uh, money, can you explain? I know you've done it probably a million times in your life. <laughs> but for someone who's listening who does not know very much about the monetary system, uh, do you want to go through like how you would, I guess, explain the monetary system to people who, like, I don't know, someone who's like, yeah, but I like my credit card because I don't like to carry cash with me. And that's like a very convenient yeah, thing for yeah, me yeah. to have. How would you kind of present the monetary system and kind of sure, like its yeah. politics to someone like that? Well, the first thing to say is that there's a difference between um, sometimes you'll find this debate. People will say like, "What is money?" <laughs> All right, it's like it's always this like big like existential question, and I sometimes find that question like a little bit, mm, you know, it's like it's like asking like, "What is art?" <laughs> like that. like it's like there's no real singular thing we have historical examples right, right of what these things are what we currently call money has a particular structure to it right uh-huh. um so in our current monetary system has a very specific um multi-layered structure and there's a big problem in society where people often don't recognize that multi-layered structure they'll sort of just generically refer to it as money and they'll I sometimes call this the Atomi, the one type of money illusion. All right, yeah. Um, where people will think, for example, that the British pound or the euro or the dollar is a single currency, when in reality it's a whole sort of ecosystem or constellation that sort of orbits around a center, as it were. Um, mm. And actually there's multiple different issuers of, for example, the US dollar, um, issuing money in different forms in different uh kind of layers and so so yeah like i when i'm trying to highlight the politics of of money it helps to have a first have a kind of like an appreciation of those layers and uh yeah one of the core metaphors i try to use which i think you've already heard before um when i'm trying to sort of help a person to get a sort of initial step into understanding the current structure of the monetary system as I will ask them to think about a casino 
you know, and casino chips, right? So like, um, you know, if you walk into a casino and you hand over cash to a casino, they're going to push out chips to you. And you can make a very strong mental distinction between those chips and the cash, right? You know that the casino now owns your cash behind the counter and you have these chips. Mm -hmm. And you can pass these chips around inside the casino. And then if you happen to have them at the end of the night or not, or well, whoever has them at the end of the night can go back to the cashier and can redeem those chips back for cash and leave the casino. Um, now, most people have a very strong understanding of what's going on there. They can say, oh, there's two types of things here. There's the cash behind the counter and there are these chips that I, that I hold. And they also understand that when they hold the chip, they don't actually own the cash. All right. Mm. They can only claim the cash if they hand the chips back in. Mm. All right. And it's actually quite a good sort of opening way to start thinking about the monetary system more generally because um, the banking sector does a related thing to that. Um, if you hand the banking sector cash, uh, they're going to issue out the digital equivalent of a casino chip to you, basically. And that's what will often very confusingly be called bank deposits. Um, uh, but you can also just call it bank money or digital casino chips. So there's the units in your bank account or these digital casino chips and the banks have taken ownership of your cash. And uh, so what you know, once you sort of grasp that metaphor, you can immediately start to see some things about what's called cashless society. You know, cashless society is a society where you're dependent upon these bank issued digital casino chips and not only mm -hmm. bank issued you then have sort of a third layer on top of that where there'll be like players like paypal for example who are going to take your bank money and then issue their own money on top of that right mm -hmm. um and so there's sort of these three chained layers to the monetary system um there's a lot more complexity to that and there's some problems with the, the metaphor there you know but at some basic level that's a sure. good a good starting point to start to understand so you know cashless society is when you know you, you lose access to that first layer of money and are forced to use the second and third layer of money in digital form under the control of corporations mm. um and there's a bunch of structural problems that emerge emerge from that the other important thing to like bear in mind is that in the sort of second layer of our monetary system which is controlled by the banking sector rather than rather than the state the banking sector unlike a casino has the ability to push out a lot more of these digital casino chips as it were than it has in layer one reserves right? right and in the old days they used to call this fractional reserve banking uh it's more accurately referred to as credit creation of money they just can create these these um new units of second layer money in order to and they'll do it when they're giving out loans right mm. so if you rock up and you have a, like a whatever you're trying to get a mortgage or you're trying to get whatever or you're trying to start a business they'll just issue out this new layer two money to you right um and that's a political that's a political process, right? The, you know, the banking sector gets to decide what parts of the economy they're going to mobilize or not, right? They're highly prepared to say, you know, like mobilize the mortgage markets because they can take your house as collateral, but they they might not want to do it for, you know, um, stuff that's more socially useful, for example, right? And so one of the big mm -hmm. critiques that emerges of the banking sector is that they, they have this power to create money and mobilize whole sections of the economy, but they selectively choose to use it for only certain things. And that's political. That affects the composition of your economy. That affects, you know, who who's getting what, right? So um, there's a bunch of politics. And in a cashless society, you're basically totally captured by that second layer of the money system. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this, you know, this is why I would go into sort of protect the cash system to say it's super important to keep this um balance of power such that we are, are keeping you know balance between these different layers and different issues um, but it also this this sort of uh, scenario also played into the origins of bitcoin right because bear in mind in the 1990s and stuff people were looking forward into the internet age mm. And they were saying, you know, if we end up in this scenario where we, where we don't have access to physical cash, we're going to basically be captured by these big digital players. Mm. Now, people in the crypto scenes didn't necessarily have a sophisticated vision of how the monetary system was operating. They didn't necessarily think about the layers. They might have had this sort of crude mythology of thinking about money, but they basically intuited a certain thing, which is 
digital money like fairly correct requires right. a bunch of intermediaries who can see what you're doing and they right, can right. choose to stop what you're doing so there, there's the, the underlying intuition behind stuff like bitcoin is basically sound um but rather than saying we should protect the physical cash system the intuition in the crypto world was like digitization is inevitable therefore we must build mm. a kind of sort of decentralized version of a digital cash in order to to uh so it's quite interesting looking at the crypto world because often they'll contest certain aspects of of the money system and you know saying like hey we, we should have not have these central players but they won't contest other elements of capitalism for example acceleration and automation mm. all right so they'll be like we, you cannot stop automation and you cannot stop acceleration. So let's go with it. Mm. Um, and that's like a difference with me, for example. So like mm. when I'm doing work on protecting the physical cash system, you'll have people in the crypto scene who are like, oh, that's kind of interesting, but don't you think it's futile to try to hold on mm. to some sort of analog, non-automated, non-digital thing, mm. right? Um, and that's, you know, for example, a point of divergence that I'll start to have with them. Right. It, I mean, I think this particular view probably comes, I mean, it comes from like the contradiction of probably like the techno utopianism of like, you know, uh, or is it like the sovereign individual with like, maybe like, um, I mean, an understanding of, 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 it's like you want to be, you want to have your own individual power but at the same time, the internet is a bit of a surveillance machine or like it's something that um, we are not digital beings and therefore you have to rely on some sort of digital infrastructure yeah. uh, in which they can see everything. So you have to like, how do you deal with the contradiction of keeping your, you know, personal liberty on a technical, yeah. on, the, on this of course, yeah, you know, yeah, communications yeah. mechanism? And so, yeah, they have this whole, uh, yeah, they create then this narrative about, about all this stuff. Sure. Yeah, yeah, of course. And then I mean, there's lots of, from an ideological perspective, there's very really fascinating stuff going down in, in crypto land. You know, like, um, how do you say it's like, like, yeah, like these sort of um, fantasies of the individual and stuff like mm. this. And, um, you know, and, and I suppose that's one of the interesting kind of parts of, of crypto is like you have these, um, like, like, for example, I mean, this is a bit of an aside, but like one of the things I find <laughs> most fascinating in the crypto world is like the, the, the underlying libertarian position has a, has a contradiction in it. Right, which is that I'll have, I'll have a sort of um, a kind of a statement about human behavior, which is to say that you know humans at some level are fundamentally selfish. All right, at least there's, there's a version of that argument going on there somewhere, saying you know not only are people selfish, but actually there is a virtue in pursuing your own egotistical ends. So there is at least in some parts of libertarianism mm. this like ethical egoism, mm -hmm. which is to say. The only truly correct thing to do is to follow your own interests, right? All right, right. and that this is like a kind of, um, it's like a variant of utilitarianism, except like applied to like your own interests. Mm -hmm. So you should do what maximizes your own self-interest mm -hmm. rather than what maximizes the collective interest, um, and that's basically like economics has that position sort of embedded in, into it at some level as well, right? Um, but it creates these sort of like problems for example you know like like they'll they'll be like a lot of libertarians won't know if they've sold out if they start pursuing their own interests by working for the government mm. or like <laughs> sell, you know like Pelinter, you know a classic example that's like run by these like libertarians but they like sell state sort of surveillance software right and services yeah. and they're like you know um i'm going on a bit of a ra like, <laughs> random, <laughs> random aside here um but uh, who's the guy who runs Palantir again? Peter Thiel. No, uh, yeah, his, his uh, Joe Lonsdale, yeah. Yeah. his his protege. You know, I've watched Joe, Joe Lonsdale being on a stage once, and I was at uh, Singularity University in, in the U.S. And Joe yeah. Lonsdale rocked up there to talk about Palantir to, for for the students. Yeah. And he went on this long thing about how he supports the seasteading movement, mm. right? Building stateless cities on the sea. And this is like he says this in the same breath as he's like selling state level surveillance equipment or, or like mm. like expertise right and he didn't see a contradiction in this right it's like mm. isn't there like a massive ideological contradiction but in his mind like he's like a businessman so he's like it's as a businessman um it's in my moral interest or so it's morally correct for me to p pursue uh profit mm -hmm. and if that means working for like the government then fine but yeah. like he had this other compartment in his mind for being like anti-government. Mm. And I think you find this like loads in crypto where there's these, these strange like 
uh, contradictions in libertarian thought around yeah, of you course. Know, we're actually sort of like highly pro capitalism but we kind of like want to reject the idea that capitalism involves like centralization of power and mass corporations who take stuff over and right. um, anyway i'm kind of I'm kind of <laughs> no, i think i mean like yeah I've, I've noted it before just like there's a i mean yeah there's a bit of a it's, it's a bit of a meme but there's a pipeline between like you start off as like a hyper or individualistic libertarian and you end up coming like really far right into like authoritarian kind of fascism uh, oftentimes um yeah, it's a bit of a meme. For sure, and that's a big um, trend. Right? I think that's how, when you, over time, deal with the contradiction, depending on which side of the thing that you like, of the contradiction you are more into, you can veer into like this authoritarianism where then you just like reject kind of the other half of the contradiction, just go full in. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, but uh, so the money system, um, I think, you know, in case people... Are, are, are trying to keep up like from based on my understanding right there's often this uh, uh incorrect notion that it's the governments that makes money per se or like adds money to the economy usually it's retail banks um who create credit and that's like yeah a big yeah. majority of, of the money that gets added into the economy that's something that's often missed and is part of and so it's often ignored in like the the libertarian kind of narrative and therefore the original crypto narrative or yeah, the most yeah, common yeah. one about like you know money printer go burr um it's really like retail banks take taking like uh really like central banks kind of incentivizing retail banks to take out loans from them to yeah credit to the economy yeah and then there's a symbiotic connection between the different layers in the money system but actually operationally speaking most of the money creation takes place by commercial banks, you know, mm -hmm. like so. Um, and yeah, you think if you think about it, I mean, I'm trying to think of like how you how you explain this. Like um, the monetary system was always expanding and contracting constantly, right? There's always new mm -hmm. money being created and destroyed as people um, destroyed via taxes. Yeah, not only yeah. taxes, but by like paying back loans, right? So, so, right. so you can kind of see that there's a sort of a symmetrical processes going on. So there's like in a normal monetary system, you'll have these different layers of issuance. So like, for example, the government's issuing money, um, but then the banking sector is also issuing money, right? The banking sector issues a lot more money than the government when mm -hmm. it's when it's making loans, for example. But then there's the reverse processes as well. When people are paying back loans, money is being destroyed, mm -hmm. right? And also when people are paying taxes, for example, or any kind of payment to the government, money is being destroyed as well. So there's these, these constant simultaneous issuances and destructions of money going mm. on at uh, different places of the economy kind yeah of. yeah exactly exactly so you know we're, we're, for example you, you know you can you can even map this in your own life you know if you have a loan with a bank and you like well let's even a credit card all right and you have to pay back your credit card like every time you're pushing you know pay you're destroying some money right mm. that was that money was created through the through the credit creation of money in the banking sector it was sort of second layer money gets destroyed when you repay your credit card um similarly when you're about to when you're like filing your tax return you go into your bank account and you say like you know you, you type in the government's bank account into your transfer <laughs> box and you say you know send money mm. what's actually going to happen is that you know the bank is going to I mean, there's a bunch of mechanics, but in the end, the final analysis is going to manifest as uh, money going into the central the, the, the bank, the central bank account of the government, and that's where money goes to die. Right, right. right. Like that, that money doesn't exist. That's like a kind of that's like a black hole. It right. disappears. It's the alpha and omega. Of exactly, money. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Right, and then so so and people you'll and this is one of the big topics you'll find in like communities like the modern monetary theory, like MMT and stuff. They focus a lot on these processes. Um, but the basic point is that this 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 money creation is constantly going on, and you know, and a lot of it's happening at the front lines of the banking sector. So you know, like for example. You're sitting in Commerce Bank or you're sitting in Barclays um, in London. And I don't know, some like, it's a very cliched example, like, I don't know, a property developer comes and they're like, we're going to, we want to build some no new mall on the outskirts of Birmingham. Um, there is land there. There's a labor market where we can ask people to work for us. We have all the various components available to make this thing appear out of the ground, mm -hmm. but we need the money to do it right and the banking sector will say okay here we go we're going to issue a bunch of new second layer digital casino chips to you 
Mm. Now they're in your account, boom, right? That's a loan. Now you can use the payment system to send those to other people to make them turn up to build your building, mm -hmm. right? So they'll then use the payment system to transfer all those units and people will rock up, contractors will get paid. Mm. Um, and the, the bet that's going on in the banking sector is that in the process of mobilizing that new, those new resources, which include like natural resources and human labor, something is going to get created, which will create new monetary flows, right? Mm. Um, which will in turn enable the thing to be paid back at some point. Right. So in many ways, the, the banking sector is like creeping around, mobilizing parts of the economy. If you have a romantic perspective on this, you'll imagine that they're doing some kind of like, they're doing God's work. They're sort of helping people <laughs> to get employed and stuff. Yeah. Um, but as job a, creators, <laughs> job creators, well, they're, they're, they're enabling, like they're giving quote unquote liquidity. It's, I hate that, that term, but like they're, they're enabling the economy to breathe. Yeah. Right. Yeah. In the absence, because think about it, in the absence, imagine there's a, there's, a, there's a bare plot of land and a bunch of people who want to work. All right. Um, in an original human economy 20,000 years ago, if you have a bunch of people facing a bare plot of land, they don't need money to like rock up there and make do something. Right. right. Like, but in a, we're going to make food on this. Yeah, they will just do it. <laughs> right. They have the ability. It's like you have your body in the land. You're going to do something. Right. Um, whereas in the capitalist economy, you basically cannot operate on your intuitions unless you have money to uh, uh, tie it into the process because you're part of this vast like interdependent organism. So the banking sector will like step in there and sort of provide the money to like enable that those processes to happen. At least this is the sort of romanticized theoretical vision of banking. Um, so, you know, in a healthy banking sector, if it was well structured and it had good incentives and stuff, hypothetically, you could imagine a productive banking system that said, hey, we're going to mobilize people to build renewable energy resources. It's not going to create infl inflation because they'll be building, as we create new money, they'll be building useful things that will neutralize the inflationary effects. It'll help us to live better lives and so on. And sure, so the sure. politics of like alternative finance and financial reform tends to be around, you know, how do you steer those processes? How do you get better outcomes of it? Um, you know, what happens when your entire banking sector is controlled by these giant corporations who don't give a mm. shit and they only want to serve their shareholders and so on, mm. you know, that's the kind of... Yeah. Um, so then like in this, so like because, uh, you know, these assumptions and the structure exists in the banking system already, like my kind of, um, my feeling about it, and I'm, I'm curious if you like, you agree or disagree, is kind of like that there is this... Um, yeah, there's a lot more power to retail banks uh, because they're able to have direct access to central banks to uh, to get loans for them to then loan out uh, to the economy. But usually what's kind of happened is that these banks are very, I mean, they're conservative in many ways. And so they, uh, they're they more incentivized to give out loans to other corporations that they kind of yeah, focus yeah. their clientele on like big corporations because they're going to take out bigger loans um and you know whatever they have more capacity to make good on those loans they probably feel in, uh, as well sure yeah, um, yeah. so as kind of like i don't know as they become bigger they want to deal with bigger customers yeah so we have scale this... seeks scale yeah yeah so then yeah and that's a, that's a story prefer. of capitalism actually you know and I suppose the sort of romanticized libertarian visions of capitalism, they'll imagine somehow that it's a realm of these sort of small mom and pop shops who are all trying to like do, you know, do their thing. But that's like a very marginal part of actual capitalist systems, right? Mm. Actual capitalist systems, you have gigantic oligopoly structures where the oligopolies want to deal with each other, right, right? right? The banks are sort of in competition with each other, but they're mostly like collaborating. Right. Um, and... You know, this is a big part of cashless society. Like a lot of human beings actually like cash, but if you're looking at a big corporate retailer, for example, they hate cash. It's mm. like Uber, for example, doesn't want individual customers rocking up saying like, oh, can I hand cash to your driver? They're like, no, no, no. You're going to send a message to your bank and tell your bank to, to uh, transfer to our bank. That's mm. what you're going to do. And it's going to happen in an automatic fashion, right? We don't want to have to deal with you. Right, because at scale you want to automate everything and then, and scale everything up, and that means dealing with other super large automated players. And so, this is why you know big tech and big finance always sort of fusing together. Um, Too many and, costs involved. In yeah, yeah. So this is this is a big thing going on in the financial sector um, all the time. Is these these massive players 
um, are, are kind of like scratching each other's backs and stuff. And mm-hmm. um, or even when, or even when they're sort of trying to deal with small players, you know, like Lloyd's Bank or something in the UK, giving out lots of mortgages to individual people. It'll try to automate those processes and standardize those processes such that it doesn't actually have to deal with those people as humans. Mm. They, they say, like, you're not really humans to us. You're sort of this necessary evil that we have to deal with in order to make profit. But we're not going to deal with your, idiosyncras- your idiosyncrasies as human beings. You're going to have to go through a bureaucratic process to interact with us, a standardized rule set. Right, you're going to, have to show us a bunch of things, um, have a bunch of automated like you know credit checks and things like that, and then we'll decide based on essentially like algorithms rather than you know a human banker who's going to sit there and decide if you could get a loan or not. Mm. Um, and then once we have your mortgage issue it out, you know we're going to like package that up into a big bundle and do like super large scale like risk management processes. Like we don't care about your individual mortgage. Mm. So this is this is yeah. a big thing in, in finance is that like. They're operating at such scale that they don't really care about individuals. Hi, everyone. If you're enjoying this episode so far, be sure to subscribe, leave a review, share with a friend, and join the crypto leftist communities on Discord or Reddit, which you can find links to in the show notes. If you're enjoying the episode or find the content I make important, you can pitch into my efforts starting at $3 a month on patreon.com slash the blockchain socialist to help me out and join the nearly 100 other patrons that contribute financially, which really helps since making this stuff isn't free in terms of money or time. As a patron, you'll get a shout out on an episode and access to bonus content like Q&A episodes where you can submit and vote on questions you'd like me to answer and I'll give my thoughts in roughly 20 minutes. The current bonus episodes have so far explored plenty of topics, including how co-ops and DAOs relate, whether there is a socialist blockchain, a review of previous crypto events I've been to, and recently a video reaction to an episode of The Deep Program. Of course, I'll still be making free content like this episode to help spread the message that blockchain doesn't need to be used to further entrench capitalist exploitation if we put our efforts into it. So if that message resonates with you, I hope you'll consider helping out. Sure. Um, yeah. So, so like kind of the the way I kind of um try to frame like a reframe the money uh kind of question for a lot of uh libertarians is kind of like it's not about it's not that we need like a hard money in order to make things more equal uh for people. So I think that's kind of the thing oh, that yeah, a lot sure, of them try sure. to get they get at like, well, Bitcoin is a better money because there's only uh, twenty there's only ever going to be twenty one million, so we all know how yeah, much it's going sure. to be and that makes it more fair. Um, and the problem is that like government prints all the money and therefore, you know, they have all the power, uh, like I'm sympathetic to like, I don't know, whatever, um, large actors do have like way more power in the system, but it's like, it's more, it's like private actors that have special access to money creation Mm. that everybody else do not. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's like a very, it's clearly very anti-democratic. And so like, I don't know, I kind of think of like the closer you are to the flow of money, like the easier it is to make money. Uh, it sounds like very obvious, but I think, um, you know, banks can easily make a lot of money because they're like next to the spigots, you know? Um, yeah. One of the most interesting things in crypto is that historically, like something like libertarianism, or at least, for example, anarcho-capitalism, these these belief systems are they're almost not designed to be actually implemented they're they're, yeah. they're, they're, they're more supposed to operate as platonic ideals yeah like, like a kind of like unachievable yeah, yeah, yeah. a type of an unachievable like you know an asymptote a, 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 a flare that sits there in the sky uh. and then it's like people, people know they're never going to get there but they're like well it sort of helps us to structure our actual world, mm-hmm. all right? So, so a lot of like libertarianism and, and stuff is like, it's like an ideal type rather than something that actually exists. Uh, you'll find versions of this in left-wing thought too, these sort of mm. unachievable ideals that sort of act as a kind of like a, you know, like a beacon. Mm-hmm. Um, and what was really interesting in crypto is that there's sort of one element, is that they kind of like broke that... Um, uh what's maybe like a sort of tacit agreement that you're not actually supposed to try to act out the ideal (laughs) they suddenly had like tools to try and literally code the ideal Mm. right and then try to actually do it and then hit Mm. up against the reality of what actually happens if you in some in some ways you don't want to enact the ideal because you'll suddenly realize that it doesn't work Mm. it's better to just have it floating there in the sky okay so in crypto they'll be like okay we're going to use bitcoin to like 
encode the hard ideal of like a hard money. And so like, okay, well, what's going to happen? Well, the actual fiat money system will like run circles around you and eat your system, mm. right? It'll turn your hard commodity money into an object to be traded in the fiat money system. That's what it's going to do de facto in the mm. actual capitalist system. And for you to not see that, you're going to have to engage in a bunch of like cognitive dissonance to keep your belief alive. Right. All right. right. Um, so I don't know if that makes sense, but there's, there's a very fascinating like innocence in the crypto world where they actually right. believe that the ideal was supposed to be achieved. Right. Uh, <laughs> but I think it's an innocent, but it's like also as well, like, I mean, a lot of people, uh, I think in the past couple of years, I feel have been maybe a little bit disillusioned or disenchanted by the fact that it hasn't happened. Yeah, yeah. Well, like exactly. This was or... what, what happens if you actually tried to enact the ideal and you realize mm -hmm. that it's, it's a kind of like, it doesn't really exist, right? It's a, um, it's it's like you know. Have you ever heard? And I don't, I don't want to pick on people with libertarian tendencies here, but like, have you heard the word freedom, for example, in libertarianism? It's it's mm. it's, it's like position as if it's supposed to mean something absolute. Right. There is no such absolute thing as an absolute freedom. freedom. Like it's it's a word. It's like an English word. That's all it is, right? <laughs> like what it actually right. ex, uh, manifests as in your physical being is very confusing because, like, if you think about it, like, what is freedom supposed to mean? You don't even right. have freedom in your own body. You have to eat every day, right? <laughs> you don't have freedom to decide that you're not going to do that. I mean, at some level, maybe you do, but like, it's at some level, it's like slightly absurd to imagine that there's a pure essence called freedom, right. or a pure it's essence right. called anything, right? Like. Uh, and so, so really these types of like, um, these words are really these sort of abstract concepts that act, they're not there to actually be achieved. They're there to sort of like influence our behavior as like beacons, right? Mm -hmm. And you sort of will deploy these words to try and like influence behavior, mm -hmm. right? But if you actually had to, you know, you know, create a, a sort of like, you know, people who, who create sort of intentional societies do this. So like, we're going to encode a very hard set of rules about how you're supposed to behave. Mm -hmm. And then you suddenly realize that it's like just falls apart. Mm -hmm. Right. So like the history of like libertarian, like free states and stuff, like you, you try and like live by this ideal and then you realize that it actually is a giant shit show. Right. 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 And then everyone's disillusioned by the ideal. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a bit similar to this in like Bitcoin. They'd be like, okay, we've discovered the perfect money. It's like, okay, and yet, like, why is it doing all this, like, really messed up stuff? And why hasn't everyone adopted it already? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And why is it that, like, it's priced in US dollars and, like, nobody in the banking sector really gives a shit, right? Yeah. It's like, well, because in the actual capitalist economy, this thing doesn't operate as the ideal thing you imagine it operates. What it's operating is as a commodity to be traded, mm -hmm. all right? Um, and that's, in a way, what it is, right? And so, so, yeah, this is one of the most fascinating elements in the crypto world is these sort of almost, I mean, there's different ways of putting it, like puritanical, um, innocent, naive beliefs that you can mm. somehow enact these types of like ideal type, um, you know, the amount of time I mean, I was on, I was on Twitter or X or whatever you call it yesterday and I saw Max Kaiser. Uh, you know, Max and I mm. used to like kind of have some level of alignment mm -hmm. until he went like totally like, you know, full Bitcoin. And he had this whole weird long, long tweet rant where he's like, Bitcoin is the perfect money. Right. And I was like, that's so that's counterintuitive to me. I would like never say something like this. I don't like the belief in a perfect form is like so right. abstract. Right. It's so like platonic. Like, and I, I use this word platonic ideals, right. but like, you know, like if you I don't know if you know, like, about like, like Plato and stuff. Like, yeah, yeah, that's uh, yeah. You, you, know, you create this like sort of this, this realm of like these like strange things that float beyond beyond the human realm, right? And it's like um, there's like Max Kaiser saying it like Bitcoin is the perfect money. And it's like if that was actually the case, like why why does it you know? Really? I think it's also like I think it's one of the questions is like for who? Yeah, who exactly. is it a perfect money for? Yeah, but Maybe again, <laughs> it's going back to this contradiction thing. It's like he's got a, like a non-contradictory way of thinking. He's like, there is a perfect way of being. Right. It's like, right. how on earth did you come to the, under, the, the the belief that there's a perfect way of being? That's like in a strangely, like it's so puritanical. It's so like, um, it's like des desperately yeah. seeking some kind of certainty that doesn't exist. And that's what I find so mm. counterintuitive in that. But I could also maybe empathize. I can say like, okay, there are some people in this world who desperately want some kind of certainty. They desperately yeah. want to be told yeah. that there is a perfect way of being and there's a, there's a perfect thing. And then Bitcoin perhaps for some people stands as the perfect incarnation of money. 
And then it's sad because you'd see the reality, which is that like it's just a commodity being traded in normal markets. And you're like, wow, it must be like a weird way of imagine having to live with that all the time, that cognitive dissonance where you're constantly seeing that this ideal of yours is just treated like an asset to be traded by like traders. Mm. You know. Um Anyway, I'm kind of walking. <laughs> no, but, I, I, but, feel, but, I feel like I'm just doing these long, like, like six No, but they're strange. great. They're great. Uh, but, Brett, one Bitcoin is one Bitcoin. <laughs> oh, wow. It's and so deep. That's, believe, so, that's so deep. I didn't realize all, that. If we all believe Jeez. that Bitcoin is money, then Bitcoin will become... We just need people to believe. That's true. In, in you know, and it's, it's, it's like also like if you're driving in a car and you're and you're like... You're looking out the window and you're like, actually, the car is not moving. What's happening is that the road below me is flying in the opposite direction. <laughs> it's like, yeah, well done. Or like, I'm, I'm you know, I, I'm, I'm busy like being, is that there's like, there's like a, 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 a kite, like whooshing around the vortex of, of, a, of a hurricane. And I'm like, actually, the kite is staying static. It's the hurricane that's r- r- <laughs> racing around it. That's what's going on here, you know? Right, and right. that's like how you protect your belief, yes, right? Yeah. So, so like, you're like, oh, you know, Bitcoin is the, the single thing that's staying static while the rest of the monetary system is racing around it. It's mm-hmm. like, wow, that's, you know, yeah, you yeah. can choose to believe that if you want. What, so, <laughs> yeah, so like one of the um, the arguments that I kind of I took from you that I put in the book about money was um, your thing on counter trade that yeah um, and I, I mentioned this I, I tried to spread the word to, to Vitalik whenever I was talking to him but um, that oftentimes I mean people will say like oh but I can buy things with crypto I can go online and you know send them some crypto and then I get I get my thing yeah but what oftentimes happens is that you're paying crypto in the price of what is the actual money so I'm paying like ten dollars of bitcoin to buy this thing yeah you're paying with its its resale price yeah so yeah. what we're essentially doing is is a counter trade we're using the commodity the of crypto to trade for the other commodity i'm trying yeah, to buy yeah, yeah. um it's not exactly barter either it's like we have an imaginary price in our head um that is linked to the mon- monetary system as like a yeah, is, yeah 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 and, and this is a way that we uh, actually get around the actual monetary system um, and this is like a good thing. That, yeah, I actually yeah. think, you know, I, I do a lot of, at least when Bitcoin was sort of its like most zealot, zealot, what's the word? Mania. Z- zealotish oh. phase, which <laughs> a couple of years ago and stuff. You know, I'd often have to have these sort of debates with people who are heavily invested in it. You know, you know I'd raise this point that, you know, a large part of the crypto world operate through counter trade. Um which is basically the process when you're using something's monetary resale price as a guide for how much of it to exchange for something else that has a monetary resale price, mm-hmm. right? Um, and you can you can do counter trade with any object in the world, right? You can you can use a computer, you can use a mug, you can use you know whatever like wooden uh, floorboards. Okay, mm. I'm just randomly picking <laughs> things in this room, right? Anything that has a monetary price, you can do counter trade with, right? You can say you know, these cushions here cost 50 euros, um, but your microphone costs, I don't know, 100 euros. I'll give you two cushions for that microphone. Mm. And, you know, if you're an alien from outer space looking from this, looking at it and you'd only seen this example, you might say, oh, well, these people engage in barter. Uh, that's one way of perceiving it. Or else you might say, oh, they seem to use cushions as a currency. Mm. Right, that person gave two cushions for that one thing. That must be the the, the money system, right? I got a lot of pillows in the bank account. <laughs> yeah, but what was actually happening there was like rather than reselling the cushions for a hundred bucks and giving you the hundred bucks, we just superimposed those two interactions over each other, cancelled out the money part of it, and then just like handed each other the goods, mm. which is a sort of a clearing process, which makes it look like. Um, no money was involved or else that the one of those things was the money. But mm. if we're doing cushions with a, to a microphone, it'd be quite easy to see that both of those things have some other utility beyond exchange, right? So we'd be like, that's a sort of barter-like type of interaction. But if I disguise the cushion with a bunch of like monetary branding mm. And paint it with a dollar sign on it. For example, it becomes very easy to say, oh, that was a monetary transaction. And it's very similar in the crypto world. You have these sort of very poorly defined digital objects, which have a bunch of, which themselves are just limited edition numbers, actually. But you, you, you can, you can add, as a sort of a side 
activity, you create a cultural field around them where you have a bunch mm -hmm. of language and, and branding that sort of creates monetary imagery around these objects. Um, and then you can counter trade those objects using their speculative monetary price that you derive from like a dollar market. And then you can, through that process, you can engage in the illusion that what's happening is a monetary transaction when really what's happening is counter trade. Mm -hmm. um, and this is very, very hard for people to, gra to, to grapple with. And actually, when you show somebody that, they desperately want to reject it. Because if you're heavily vested in the crypto community, that's a sort of seen as an existential threat to actually recognize that what's happening is counter trade. Whereas I would tend to say, actually, that's a very interesting feature of these systems and actually you should embrace it. You should just call crypto tokens, or at least lots of them, counter, counter tradable collectibles, digital collectibles. And actually there's nothing wrong with that. And that's actually a useful property. And that's actually, you know, if I'm a political dissident, for example, I can use a counter tradable collectible as a way of bypassing typical monetary exchange. Right. So it's a way of saying that Bitcoin doesn't compete with the money system, it rides on top of the money system, right? That's um, obviously doesn't go along with the belief system of many like Bitcoiners, or not, not only Bitcoiners, many other crypto communities. But I personally think that's actually, there's nothing wrong with saying it. It's a, sure, it's a yeah. very successful counter trade system, probably the world's biggest counter trade system that we've ever seen. Yeah, that's what kind of, um, kind of the thing that I uh, have, you know, had to come across a lot is that like, you know, Bitcoiners or whoever crypto people will say that, um, you know, crypto is money. Um, it's like, or a better form of money or whatever, the new money. Um, and then someone, you know, who's skeptical, most likely from the left will say like, ha, no, it's not. You're lying because it doesn't do this and that as money should do. Um, and therefore you're, it's, it's bad. It's a scam. Yeah. yeah. And like my argument is like, well, it's not money and it doesn't really matter that um you know the whole reason wikileaks yeah. made made a bunch of money or like people were able to donate is because they were they were uh, of course financially blockaded and then they were able to um take in bitcoin to to get around yeah. to subvert the monetary system and that was like subversion of the monetary system is like a practical i mean it's like a useful sure yeah. thing to do and tool to have one of, one um, of the one of the nuances of this though and maybe this is why it's a lot of the politics of bitcoin come in is that mm -hmm. Okay, de facto, it's a counter tradable collectible, a limited edition set of money branded objects that you can and that have a monetary price and you can use their monetary price to engage in exchange, the resale price essentially. So if I'm in El Salvador and I'm in a restaurant, for example, in Bitcoin Beach in El Salvador, mm -hmm. the you know, typically a restaurant will have set prices on a menu, mm -hmm. say 20 US dollars for this thing, and they don't change the menu every 30 seconds. Right. All right. If I ask to pay in Bitcoin and Bitcoin Beach, they don't have a set Bitcoin price. What? Because what's actually what they're actually going to use is a counter trade ratio. So they'll first have to check what the current going price of Bitcoin is on its speculative market. They'll then calculate a counter trade ratio to say like how much Bitcoin would have to be sold in order to equate to twenty US dollars. Mm. All right. So it'd be like, oh, you want to pay us, quote unquote, pay us in Bitcoin. For this meal okay pay us this much it'll equate to 20 us dollars it's a counter trade right um so you're basically paying with the us dollar resale price of the bitcoin right mm -hmm. um now that's that's what's de facto going on but ideologically it's very very hard to let go of the sort of mythology of it being money because um normally a counter trade object will have some other use beyond exchange Mm -hmm. All right. So for example, let's say I'm counter trading cushions for microphones. The cushion, if I'm imagining it as a being, it doesn't have any existential anxiety as to what it is. It's like, I am a cushion. I make things comfortable for you. <laughs> the microphone doesn't have any existential anxiety. It's like, I amplify your voice and put it onto the computer. <laughs> right. They, they don't have any sort of identity problems. Right. Uh, they don't require, uh, they, they're not, they don't have any need to masquerade as being a monetary system. Mm. Right. Whereas if you take a, um, uh, you know, a invisible digital object that has no, um, uh, no use, essence, use value. <laughs> essence beyond the fact that it's a number written out after a bunch of energy is expended. Yeah. It actually has a lot of existential anxiety as to what it is. Right, All right. right. So the claiming to be a money system is a very, very important part of how this thing 
um, tries to get a monetary price, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? And if you say, you know what, you should just accept the fact that you're not a monetary system and just accept this role as a counter trade object, it poses a kind of existential threat to the same to, the, to this thing, right? Um, so actually, for the Bitcoin community, it's incredibly important to constantly try to differentiate it as a sort of better form of money to the actual system. And unfortunately, the main way they're going to do that is by the main way to differentiate yourself is to re resort to a bunch of extremely conservative monetary ideology about how hard money, mm. right? Now, bear in mind, it's not a monetary system. It's a counter trade object that needs a marketing pitch, all right? But the marketing pitch has to be drawn from conservative monetary ideology. So even if this thing ends up being useful as a counter trade object, as an ideological system, it ends up being like a kind of a, like a, a, a means to spread conservative ideology about money. And this is one of the most damaging aspects of the Bitcoin system is it's useful as a counter trade object, but as an ideological movement, it's like spreads a whole bunch of extremely conservative thinking about what money is and what it should be. All right. Yeah. Um, and yeah, like that's the kind of the main, and this is also puts off lots of like lefties, for example, they'll kind of like buy into these debates about, right. you know, the marketing that community around Bitcoin is pushing out all the super like conservative thoughts about money, even though Bitcoin doesn't actually compete with the actual monetary system. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. So uh, um, how about when it comes to stable coins? For example? That, I think that is maybe uh, sure. Yeah. Some people, they may bring up like, well, I can have, I have dollar pegged coins that I can yeah, use yeah, yeah. To, that are the same value of as the US dollar, therefore, it is essentially the US dollar. Yeah, and then it, it, it is, you know, and actually I hate that term stable coin. It's a kind of a slightly ridiculous term. And bear in mind the original reason why they called them stable coins, it was supposed to be like, it's like Bitcoin except stable, all right? So like mm. this, well, this was the taxonomical strategy Right. right. It's like it's it's the, of the same class of object as Bitcoin, but it somehow has a sort of stable thing. It's like, no, the, the better way to describe it is like it's like PayPal, except implemented mm -hmm. on a decentralized, like you know, mm -hmm. um, database rather than a centralized mm -hmm. one. But I guess it kind of alludes to kind of like the the reasoning why they thought it needed to exist as like a either getting more people in who are like more conservative about like uh, you know. Um, exposure to volatility of markets or like as a thing to traders that they can like you know you can put it in a safe spot whenever yeah. you're like getting out of a trade or something but it's it's Obviously. a totally different class of um if you're looking at tokens in the world like there's a bunch of different like primitives for tokens um and you know you can split them into a bunch of like categories like for example there's like the blank token this is the kind of words I use. Like a blank token is a token that has no characteristics beyond the fact that it's a token. Mm -hmm. You know, so like a a piece of plastic with like nothing written on it is like a blank token. It's sort of like an empty signifier, right? And Bitcoin's like a blank token. It, it in itself it has no actual characteristics beyond the fact that it can be moved around. And then it has a sort of marketing apparatus that sort of pastes imagery over that token. Um, you then have, for example, like a a badge. You know, like a badge is a token that's handed to you when you do something in particular. All right, you know, you were a good boy at school. Um, you did well in your test. He has a badge for you. He has a gold star. The gold star represents something that you did, but you can't actually go and use that gold star for anything, right? You can show your parents and say, look, I was a good boy. It, but, but it doesn't do much beyond that. It doesn't guarantee you access to anything. You can't like yeah. rock up at a, a nightclub and say, look, I've got a gold star. This means you have to give me entry. Uh -huh. They'd be like, well, it means nothing to us, right? Where, and then you have like access tokens, for example, like access tokens are things that do explicitly give you access to something. And, and so like a, a stable coin, at least the sort of traditional ones, are in more in the realm of access tokens. And, you know, and that's a very different thing. That's like most money operates as access tokens. Um, and so... You know, and, and I was sort of saying earlier on, like about how the monetary system, you can sort of see it in these layers, the stablecoin systems, at least the sort of, again, like things like Tether and Circle and stuff, they're basically not that different to PayPal, which mm -hmm. is a part of the third layer of the money system. It's like you hand them bank dollars and they issue you basically a voucher mm -hmm. for those bank dollars. And then you can move that voucher around. And with PayPal, you're moving the voucher around using a centralized system. With a stable coin, you're using some decentralized system to move the voucher around. But in the end, they're both pegged or, or sort of tethered back to the uh, sort of ba the banking sector. Um, 
And in a normal monetary system, those chained layers um, start to collapse into one, right? So you, most people don't make this distinction between the different, you know, I mentioned that the Atomi, the one type of money illusion before, mm. like they start to just say, oh, there's like the pound or like the dollar. They start to collapse the um, different layers into a singular term and start to basically see them as interchangeable. And often they are interchangeable, right, directly. Um, and so that happens with stable coins too, actually. People do see them as interchangeable with US dollars and they become part of the overarching network and sort of psychological structure of the US dollar system. Mm. Um, and so they operate far more like a monetary system than something like Bitcoin would. Actually, you'd probably use dollar denominated stable coins to price Bitcoin. Right. right. That's, you know, well, so yeah. it, be it <laughs> becomes effectively the same. It becomes part of this, the overarching dollar structure. Um, and that is actually authentically probably interesting and quite subversive at, to at some extent, at least. So, right. Um, Depends on the design, maybe. Yeah. And obviously, the algorithmic stable coins are a lot more uh, like controversial because they're <laughs> authentically attempting to untether. Right. right. But that would normally involve a bunch of like algorithmic trickery that probably involves. A, lots of weird counter trade moves and to eventual sort of, collapse and artificially of synthesize yeah. <laughs> the effect of holding a, a us dollar yeah yeah um, could you actually quickly if you can like kind of de like uh or just like name the layers of the monetary system up to like a stable coin like what sure like, like base what 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 economists would call m0 when i, I don't like that term yeah. this is called layer one Right, money easier for crypto people to understand. Yeah, layer because layer zero in any economy is actual human beings and like the world and like ecologies, right? Uh -huh. um, but like so, layer one money would be like um, at least in our current system um, issued. Let's say like you know in the US, like issued by Federal Reserve or the government, and there's a particular structure to government money, right? So it's issued out and pulled back in through taxation um, and other things, and has a particular sort of logic to it. But then there's a sort of layer two money is bank issued money um, or digital casino chips is another one of the metaphors for it um, and layer two money is like much bigger in quantity than layer one money because the banking sector is issuing out those that money to um, when it's issuing loans and stuff and that's what you see in your bank account right that's that's those are the units in your bank account layer three money is players that will take your layer two money for themselves and issue them issue you their own mm. units. So for example, like PayPal, like what what what's PayPal's business model? It'll get you to make a bank transfer to it. So now in its JP Morgan bank account, it has your 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 previous digital casino chips, right? As it now has. And now it can take the interest that you might have otherwise earned on that. Mm. All right. And can also scrape fees off you for moving its units around. Um, and like the main business model of like players like Circle, USDC and stuff is to take the interest that you would have otherwise earned on your layer two money, mm. All right? They, they'll, they'll get you to transfer money into their bank account. They'll then either like, uh, they'll, they'll probably go into like money markets and they'll use it to like buy short term government bonds or something and they'll make small amounts of interest off, mm. off that, right? And that's how they make money. You can also, and so, so stable coins will be part of that third layer, but then like part of that third layer is also like any kind of what's called like an e-money provider or e-money institutions, which are basically institutions that have to fully back themselves with layer two money mm -hmm. to issue their own money. So if you're like part of like an online poker community, for example, and you have like, mm -hmm. a, you have like a little account that you go onto and you can, you can top it up with money right you're right. basically initiating a bank transfer into their bank account kind of gift cards almost yeah know, yeah and then right. they're going to credit your account with third layer money and they say oh look you have this money here mm. in your account and right. it's like that's a third layer of money and same with like amazon all these players right and it's the same with like local currencies like many of these local currencies actually are sort of third layer systems mm -hmm. where they'll basically issue out a sort of a, a third layer voucher that could be used locally mm. um there's also like a fourth layer to the money system if you start to like get really conceptual, which is like the shadow banking sector. Sure, yeah. Where there's all these like weird money-like instruments being passed around and stuff like that. But so it's generally layer three kind of, um, because they don't have a banking license, they're technically not going to be ones who create credit. Yeah, yeah. Like layer three is like, you don't, you're, you're not a bank. You don't have an account at the central bank. 
you don't have the permission mm-hmm. to do credit creation of money, which is a process yeah. whereby you issue far more uh, uh, digital casino chips than you have in reserves. <laughs> yeah. And bear in mind what a bank does, like like you always got to think about with, with all money issuers, they, they each have their own reason for issuing money. When a state is issuing money, it's doing it to get resources, all right? So it's getting stuff from mm-hmm. you. Okay, that's how states provision themselves by issuing out money. Um, but in on the background, they're getting, for example, like military service. Mm, all right. Sure, like yeah. this kind of stuff. Whereas the, the reason why a bank issues out money in a second layer is to harvest loan agreements from the public or from people. All right. So they issue out all these like digital casino chips. And then on the other side, they're pulling back these loan assets to themselves. And that's a very risky process because that can backfire. But in the pro, if they do that correctly, it leads, it kind of creates a sort of pressure differential over time, which will suck money back to them. When it comes to players like PayPal, they're not allowed to do that process that banks do. So they're issuing up money to you to harvest your bank money and to get fees from you. Mm. All right. And so there's different sort of um, reasons why players will do it. Um, an online, you know, like, um, gambling portal will say okay you know load money onto your account mm. it's like because they want you to have a certain amount of money sitting there third layer money so you stay in the ecosystem mm. um so they will have to be regulated as e-money providers right, right. because it's like well now you have to do sort of you know right. anti-terrorism checks and stuff to see people aren't like using the system to, to launder and so on mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah yeah um so I wanted to get to um, one last thing. Maybe you recently wrote a piece called Zero is the Future of Money, mm-hmm. uh, which was super interesting. And um, I think very interesting because it came from, I imagine, like partially your experience at uh, Collaborative Finance, which is like the event in uh, yeah, yeah, Ko-Fi, yeah, at, yeah, at sure. the Commons Hub. Um, Ko-Fi is sort of like the, the new meme that they're uh, trying to create. Um, but yeah, I guess it was an attempt to kind of like synthesize uh, the different aspects of different kind of types of monetary systems being like the fiat kind of world, the uh, mutual credit, like local currency world and cryptocurrency and how, yeah, yeah. What kind of how they can be kind of synthesized into something potentially sure. new. Sure, sure, sure. Um, so do you, th- I mean, I think what I uh, respect, I guess, uh, from you is that you like are making this attempt at kind of like um, uh, more directly trying to answer like the question of money when it comes to crypto, like what does crypto actually provide mm-hmm. rather than, of course, it's like kind of complete dismissal. Um, there seems to be some things that are interesting. Yeah. So I wrote this piece, Zero is the Future of Money on my sub stack. Uh, so if you want to, maybe the people can read it. That's probably the best yeah, way to I'll link it. Yeah. 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 Um, so and, and that that piece was basically it was an, it's intended as like a gateway piece to sort of push people in a new direction yeah it's not like a detailed exploration of like um exactly what no. you should do but it's it's, it's basically it was saying I, I set it up as a thesis an antithesis and a synthesis right so number you one alien <laughs> yeah well that 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 structure goes <laughs> beyond yeah sure um, <laughs> um so yeah like sort of the thesis is me describing the existing normal monetary system. And that's like mm. one mm. minus one, which is the supposed antithesis is like the mentality in the Bitcoin world. Where I'm talking about how people in Bitcoin try to reject all the aspects of the so-called fiat money system. Mm-hmm. In particular, trying to reject both the hierarchy and the dynamism. Because mm-hmm. our normal monetary system has both hierarchy, has all these layers of these sort of chained players who have power. Um, but it also has dynamism. It's it does. It's not static. It's moving all the time, right? It's contracting and expanding and stuff, right? Um, so in the Bitcoin world, the antithesis was imagined to be like, well, we'll supposedly have no hierarchy, but we'll also have this very rigid static system. Um, the, the main form of dynamism in a Bitcoin system is the fact that you can transfer the tokens around, mm. right? So the supply stays kind of static, but you can move it around. Right, but that compared to like a normal monetary system, that's incredibly rigid. It's incredibly like, um, yeah, it doesn't have much dynamism at all. 
Um, and as I said, it mostly operates as a counter trade system. Yeah. So, but you know, it's quite interesting. You can take different aspects of those, those systems and start to synthesize them. That's what I get to zero. So like thesis one, antithesis minus one, synthesis zero. Yeah. Um, and that's looking at how you can sort of take the dynamism of credit money, which is what you find in the normal, um, uh, normal monetary system, and maybe com combine it with some of these sort of ideals around decentralization that you get in the crypto community, um, albeit with a slightly different vision of decentralization. Um, because bear in mind, in, in standard crypto, decentralization tends to mean taking one very large infrastructure that's controlled by particular people and making it controlled by like nobody. Mm. So like the ideal of decentralization is to have like a huge system that nobody controls. Right. right. That's very that's right, a very right, different right. vision of decentralization to say the original decentralization movements, which is to say you take one large infrastructure that's controlled by particular people and you break it down into much smaller ones that are controlled much more locally. Right. Right. So the original vision of decentralization in sort of like anarchist movements or, you know, like local economy movements and stuff wasn't to say that you shouldn't have anybody in control. Mm -hmm. It's just that local control should be more localized and mm -hmm. should involve have more democratic processes, right? Um, so I'm taking some of the, you know, and, this, and then I'm sort of uh, basically saying, you know, mutual credit and these sort of older, these older traditions of alternative currency where people appreciate, um, essentially have a sort of way of thinking about money as a, um, the means via which uh, interdependent networks are formed and how people enter into, into and out of obligation with each other. Um, how you can sort of take the sort of the, the wisdom of mutual credit communities and start to weave it together with the sort of the technological infrastructures of crypto and start to find some very interesting things. And, and the main reason I'm writing this piece is that I want people who've got excited about crypto, but who've subsequently become disillusioned mm -hmm. to find a new direction. Right? Yeah. Because there's lots of creative energy in crypto. There's lots of stuff, you know, people saying, oh, this is exciting technology we can work with. But then they've been pushed down kind of a dead end in terms yeah. of like the monetary thought into this very sort of like conservative way of thinking and stuff, um, all obsessed with sort of adversarial thinking and like kind of speculation and saying, you know, there's a whole other world of currency experimentation that can be done if you start to move to this alternative way of thinking about money. Um, and so in that piece, I'm also going into sort of commodity versus credit thinking of money, mm -hmm. which is like a whole big topic in itself as well. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, that's, uh, you know, and most people in the world, maybe the last thing I'll say about that piece is most people in the world are very used to having what I would call a commodity orientation to money. Mm. And a commodity orientation to money doesn't mean that you think that money is a commodity. It's a sort of a mental model whereby you sort of metaphorically think of money as if it were a commodity. Mm -hmm. right. So for example, take our normal monetary system. It isn't a commodity system, and yet people will still in their heads talk about it as if it was a commodity, mm -hmm. right? They'll imagine that there's something you've got to grab and kind of like store and right. hold and all this kind of stuff, right? So they have a very strong experience of themselves, of, of money as this kind of like um, a thing. It's just like a kind of an asset you've got to somehow like, like keep control of. And that's a commodity orientation to money. To have a credit orientation to money, you've got to see money as something that actually emanates from you mm -hmm. rather than something that you have to try and grab towards yourself right mm -hmm. so and and to understand credit thinking of money you got to understand that like the central this gets a bit like trippy but like <laughs> in an interdependent system uh -huh. um it will tend to at least in theory always net out to zero mm -hmm. okay um so like um and how, 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 would I describe, how would I describe this? Like, even in your own body, for example. Right. Think about it if you're like, even like you're a Robinson Crusoe kind of person, like, you, 
you're always kind of fluctuating above and below zero all the time, right? You eat some food, but then your energy runs down and you get tired and you've got to eat more food, right? So you're always mm -hmm. like fluctuating, right? There's no, there's no stable point that ever exists with, even within a single human body, right. all right? And similar with human communities, you're always entering into and out of obligation with each other. And it, that's fluctuating around a kind of point of balance, as it were, right? Mm -hmm. you're, as, a, as a community, you're always fluctuating around zero, right? Some One person has more energy. Another person needs to get something from them. They're then kind of like moving towards, they're moving in and right. out of obligation to each other. And actually, that's a very good starting point for understanding monetary systems because often mm. monetary systems are intermediating in this process of interdependence. And proper monetary systems have both asset and liability sides, right? So the sort of positive and negative sides. Mm -hmm. um, and mutual credit, for example, is an attempt to create these sort of community run monetary systems where people explicitly recognize that all positive credits in the system are mirrored by negative credits. All right, and they net mm -hmm. out to zero. And so that's the sort of zero is the future of money concept. Um, but it relies upon having a very strong understanding of like interdependence and stuff. So, yeah, I think totally. hope that made sense. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, yeah, I think it's it's. I've definitely like heard it before of like thinking. You, I mean, yeah, it's it, using um, like metaphors from ecology as a way to kind of like, um, I don't know, think about a human uh, social uh, interactions. Um, before I think it, it it makes a lot of sense. I think one of the things that is difficult to maybe wrap for people to wrap their heads around is that usually. I mean, one, mutual credit systems have this like plus or minus, at least like kind yeah. of like default. And this is a very, generally, we think of like, if you're in the negative, that's really bad. You're like, you're in debt and yeah, you yeah, owe yeah. someone something. Like I had, a, I had a conversation with, you know, a left-wing friend of mine and they were saying that uh, like in a mutual credit system, it doesn't solve anything because then you're just in debt and you're stuck because yeah. you're going to be in this situation where because you're going to be negative because... Well, this, this involves the illusion that you're not always in debt anyway, all right? Mm -hmm. And so this is what's fascinating about it. De facto, the, the, the human condition is you're always in debt, mm -hmm. right? You don't survive unless you have other people giving you stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And again, as I said, even in your own body, you have this going on, right? You're having mm -hmm. to, cons you know, you can try to like not eat for a few days, but at some point your body's going to say, you have to go do something now. Mm -hmm. Right, you're not, you're not, you don't have this radical freedom to just override that, um, and so as a sort of fundamental primitive, we are always in debt um, in some in some form, right? And that's not negative. That's what it means to be alive, often, right? Mm -hmm. um, and one of the main reasons why this sort of negative perception of debt forms is that in a standard capitalist system, under a standard monetary system, we only experience the asset side of money. Mm -hmm. All right. So we experience money as being these positive units that you've got to try and grab. But bear in mind from the other side of that, a money, a money issuer experiences money as a liability. Mm -hmm. Right. When the bank is, when, when banks are issuing out those digital casino chips, those are on the liability side of its balance sheet. It's stuff that it owes, right? And right, same thing for the risk. same thing for the state, actually, or the sort of units of state money. At some level, they're actually kind of um credits that, that can be redeemed back for stuff in the state. They're experienced mm -hmm. as a liability, all right? So the only reason that we can experience money as an asset is that there's a hidden shadow side somewhere else that takes on the liability side, mm -hmm. all right? Now, when you're trying to build your own monetary system, you have to take on that responsibility for accepting that you're on the liability side, all right? And normally when we're talking about debt, if you're in the position in a, normal, in a normal money system and you only experience the asset side, you're normally talking about when you're borrowing money, right? So you're saying um, the debt is measured in money, whereas in a mutual credit system, your debt isn't measured in money, it's measured in goods and services, all right? Mm -hmm. Which is the sort of fundamental primitive state of being in a uh, inter state of interdependence, mm. all right? Like, I mean, I'm trying to think, I think about being a baby, for example, yeah. like uh, you have to get actual things from your parents, right? You don't care about money. You have to get like actual real goods and services, right? And there's a right. kind of like an existential sort of like position there. Um, you cannot get out of debt as a baby. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And actually parents will not perceive as what they're doing is like racking up, racking up credit, <laughs> right? But at, at some I level, mean, we yeah. have a fund. Basically, we do not survive as human beings unless other people provide goods and services right. for us, right? And and I think this is a, so so there's, there's kind of like a type of primordial version of um, 
uh, lots of sort of credit in society is actually for real goods and services rather than for money, mm. right? So like, um, but yeah, we because we're only used to experiencing the asset side of money, we start to associate debt with becoming like, you know, indebted in monetary terms. That's I didn't explain that very well, but like this is one of the core things to kind of like grapple with. Um, and so, yeah, if, like, if you're truly interested in forming a monetary system, you have to accept debt. And actually, one of the most fascinating things you'll see in the crypto world is that people, because they're so steeped in only experiencing the asset side of money, like most of us are, they imagine that what a monetary system is, is the act of creating a bunch of positively numbered objects that you dump on top of people. And then you hope that they somehow miraculously turn that into a monetary system. All right. And so, but what would actually happen if you, if you, if you, if you got a group of a hundred people and you had a bunch of like objects that you said, okay, we have to turn this into a monetary system now. What will actually happen is that you'll have to find a way to zero those objects. So like if, if you gave everybody a thousand objects and said, create a money system, like that, that number a thousand will become the new zero in the system. Mm. It'll get neutralized essentially, right? Like you'll have to start from zero being named as 1000. Mm. And so, so like, you know, if basically if you issue everybody a thousand units, it's the same as issuing them nothing. Right. Relative. Right. Yeah. So, so in an interdependent system, what's actually going to happen is that those units will get neutralized to a new zero point and you'll only measure deviations from that. Mm -hmm. So it's only when, for example, one person goes to 1,100 and another person goes to 900 that 100 units of money have been right. created in the system. So there is a negative. You just like, you see it as a positive. Exactly. And a lot of, some of the dark the arts of, of creating alternative money systems is that you try to, you try to like trick people <laughs> with positive object or like positive number thinking. So you'll say, you'll, you'll design a mutual credit system and you'll say, rather than calling the point of balance zero, we're going to call it 1,000. So uh -huh. that everyone imagines that they've got positive credits in their account because they're uh -huh. used to being scared of being negative in the normal money system, all right? So we're yeah. gonna be like, well, let's let's as a trick name what zero as one thousand, and then the person gets to zero, and actually in reality they're minus one thousand. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. But but they're like, oh well, I've, I guess I've run out of money now. And it's like, no, what's actually happened is that you've gone into a point of debt in an interdependent system and you're required to go back to 1000 yeah. to enter balance again the end of your credit line perhaps or... yeah yeah exactly so yeah you're basically naming the end of your credit line as zero rather than minus 1000 mm. right <laughs> so there's a lot of like trickery with like taking these sort of standard commodity imaginations of money um and you know which again most people suffer from and yeah yeah uh, so yeah alternative currency designs are really fascinating when you're trying to like work with people who are used to sure. another monetary system yeah definitely um but so like i want to kind of this is maybe a little bit speculative but like if we think about like in a mutual credit system like i can i can say like it's probably this type of system is less depersonalized than the current monetary system as in like the person yeah. who takes on the liability maybe knows you like yeah, there's like a yeah, relationship yeah, sure, between the, yeah. uh, the person who has the asset and the liability. And so like y there could be situations where like, you know, technically this person owes me or something or like this person is like in the negative and we want to create a stable state again. Like I'll help my friend. I don't know, maybe I don't I don't really care about painting my wall, but it could use like a, a paint job. So, yeah, you know, I, you know, like, hey, I want to paint my paint my wall. Here's some here's some mutual credits and you're back in a more stable state. Um, in a world where mutual credit scales, then there's a potential that things become more depersonalized, similar to like, sure, the, yeah, yeah. the fiat system. Um, does that change? Yeah, but bear in mind, system? it's important to never analyze an alternative money system in isolation. Yeah. You know, you can engage in the fantasy of like, what if the mutual credit system becomes the entire monetary system in the global <laughs> world? I mean, but like, well... That's a fantasy, right? Mm. You have to think about what it actually is. What it actually is right now is an alternative system that exists on the outside of the actual main system. So in yeah. the in the early stages of the mutual credit system, you've got to be thinking about it as a type of counterpower. Yeah. All right. It's you know, going back to the Bitcoin world, there's a difference between analyzing Bitcoin for what it is versus the sort of ideal, you know, fantasy. Mm -hmm. In the ideal fantasy, you analyze it as being the world's monetary system. In reality, it's an object traded in the world's monetary system, right? right? So if you start from the reality, you get a better, 
you start to be more like practical about it. You're like, okay, given that, that that's the case, what do we do? Similar with like a mutual credit system, which has a very different monetary ideology and sort of structure behind it. But like, you've got to think about it as being a counterweight to something else that exists. And how you got to think about how people in the actual sort of mainstream economy will interact with that, given that they're probably earning most of their money somewhere else. Um, and mm. yeah, so so that's the kind of one of the fascinating things about mutual credit systems, though, is the the scale makes a big difference because you know de facto in any human economy we are interdependent. You know, even in our super large scale you know capitalist economies, we're I'm a sovereign individual. What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> exactly so so like the, the fascinating thing about sovereign individual imagination is that you essentially have lost awareness of your interdependence because of the scale of the system you've come to engage in the fantasy that you're actually separated from everyone else okay mm -hmm. because in a large-scale system it's very easy to do that it's very easy to, to not be able not see who you're dependent on all right but basically, every mm. single person you're doing a monetary transaction with is somebody who you're choosing to engage in an interdependent relationship with, right? Mm -hmm. You don't have to choose everybody, but you, on average, you have to choose a subset of everybody, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so the monetary system basically enables these different routes, um, different sort of uh, pathways you can take to fulfill your interdependence. Okay, mm -hmm. um, and then there's politics and who you choose to fulfill that. You know, you can choose your mate, or you can choose some, you know, random stranger. Okay, but in the end, you have to you're you're interdependent, and you have to find a pathway to satisfying that 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 situation. In a normal monetary system, because it's such a large scale, we can often it enables you to engage in the fantasy that actually you're totally separate and you're like quote unquote financially inter independent and sovereign mm -hmm. individuals, blah blah blah, whatever, right? Right. Um, which is you know, it's, it's fascinating that actually a lot of like libertarian thought emerges out of a context of super large scale capitalist economies that are underpinned mm. by nation states. Because actually, if you're not in that situation, you will never engage in the fantasy that you're an individual. All right. Mm. You know, yeah. in a small scale economy, you're very, very aware that you're dependent on everyone else. Yeah. Okay. So in a mutual credit system, it actually it's a monetary system in the sense that you're issuing these units and stuff, but because it's a much smaller scale, you tend to have much higher awareness of the the the, the, the the situation that you know actually economies are cooperative organisms right, right? Um, and so you tend to have a stronger kind of communitarian ethos in a mutual credit system even though what's going on is forms of exchange right mm. um, but of course if you scaled a mutual credit system to like a massive size you would start to have those forms of alienation creeping in where you stop seeing who you're dependent upon mm -hmm. and you start to engage in this fantasy of independence right and so that's you know a fascinating element of these these systems and sure, sure. if you scale the mutual credit system to like a global scale you would probably start to find financial institutions sitting up on it as well sure right yeah. they'd be like oh people have set up these like self-issued credits and there's a central administrator for how it works we can now take those credits and make our own credits on top of that they'll start doing credit yeah. creation of money yeah. they'll create their own you know sort of second layer money is on top of that and so on so mm. engaging with mutual credit systems is actually a very interesting way to engage with how the normal monetary system actually you know it's a sort of it uses similar primitives in mm. a way no i don't know if that answered your i mean yeah i mean i'm just thinking coming to mind is like the circles ubi project since i mean we were on the panel and like yeah, as part yeah, of sure. the, the application they have um i think fairly recently added the feature now the function that you can um create like a joint uh, entity that then takes part of the mutual credit system as well. So like, there's going to be like this. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know, the creation of institutions would still happen even in a system that is like mutual credit, where rather than the creation of money being siloed at you know the central banks and and retail banks, but even if it is amongst everyone, there's a still an, a, probably a need for the creation of institutions that. Um, yeah, 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 and again, flows. Again, I think it's always important to like just like emphasize this point. You have to look at these things. You can't look at them in isolation. Mm -hmm. It's like you, you have to sort of see how they interact with other entities in the in the economy. So, um, mm. you know, in, in a way, when, when sometimes when I'm just for example, go back to the Bitcoin debate because you, you know, like have, have, have you ever seen these like YouTube videos where they're like, or, or I don't know, maybe like speculation online where they're like shark versus crocodile <laughs> right and they're like what would happen if a shark had to take on a crocodile who would win right? oh yeah, yeah and it's like well you know i'm from 
South Africa, it's like, yeah, crocodiles live in fresh water. Um, sharks don't, right? <laughs> and so, and then you have this hypothetical imagined battle between these two things that don't exist in the same universe. And it's like, we could engage in the speculation, but in reality, if a crocodile had to swim out into the sea and be in salt water, it would be at a massive disadvantage against right. a shark, right? Because cro yeah. crocodiles don't, you know, there are, I mean, there are some saltwater crocodiles, but like, let's, let's take a, a freshwater crocodile versus a saltwater shark. You know, to make this a realistic scenario, you have to actually imagine what the actual situation would, would be. And it's similar with like these sort of, you know, people engage in these sort of abstract debates about whether Bitcoin's a perfect monetary system or not. It's like, who cares what it actually is in the quote unquote mm. salt water of the fiat system <laughs> is an object that's traded and totally like the system runs circles around it. Yeah. All right. In some hypothetical other universe where you set up, you could have this debate about what it could be. Mm. Uh, similar with things like, you know, you know, circles, UBI, or you know, uh, you know, mutual credit systems and stuff. It's like you could engage in the, the thought about like what if it became the whole monetary system, but that's not the, the situation, right? Sure. So um, uh, I think it's super important to think about any alternative economy project like that. It's like mm. how is it influencing an overarching ecosystem of other players? Right. So I guess your your kind of stance maybe on that is that like um, like it doesn't make sense to think about the mutual credit like mutual credit alternative currency systems like before it even becomes like big enough to like. I don't know, uh, well, to, to, to get rid of like the current existing monetary system because like might as well use it now and have it now that rather than like imagining how bad it'll be if if then that was a new dominant one because we're not- Yeah, you, but you, you should be thinking about- Holding contradiction uh, in your head. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And also just like like um, have like ideas of counterpower in your head. It's like- yeah, it's like. Yeah. The objective of the system isn't that it's going to take over. It's that you create these sort of spaces of alternative action and stuff and sort of new possibilities. Um, you don't have this like sort of absolutist abstract position where you sort of isolated vacuum sealed thought mm. experiments, right? Um, and many, I, I often get sent because I'm, you know, I've spent quite a long time in the sort of alternative money space. I'll often get these emails from some, you know, for example, like a retired engineer who... I don't know, used to work for British Aerospace, who I'm, I'm just making this up, <laughs> but this is the kind of person they'll be like, Brett, I've seen your stuff and I've worked out the perfect money system. Right. And they'll show me these, these formulas and engineering schematics of like the perfect money system. And they're like, I need to popularize this idea. Like, you know, why aren't people taking it seriously? I'm like, you know, have you thought about the politics of this? Like the actual world doesn't operate on perfect ideas. It operates on like messy human beings who engage in political systems. So even if you believe you've worked out the hypothetical perfect idea it's kind of like meaningless you have to mm. you have to sort of think about how that interacts with like actually existing human political structures right yeah um and so yeah we're filled with all sorts of people telling us like the perfect money system but like very few people who actually think about like you know who <laughs> like how are you going to make that actually happen yeah yeah you, you know like first having some experience in trying to make a currency system in the first place probably will yeah or like just have a degree of humility yeah, you know yeah. where which is like um you know and that'll probably help quite a lot in terms of like thinking realistically about these things yeah and yeah maybe the final metaphor i'll share about this is it's like it's <laughs> yes. like you know and this is sometimes like say like the, for example the bitcoin community there's this phrase like in at least in english where you say you call a spade a spade mm. And in English, that's normally assumed that you're sort of like just kind of calling bullshit on something. Mm -hmm. You're like, I'm just going to say what you actually are mm -hmm. rather than engaging in some kind of like, you know. But actually, if you think about it, spades are very useful. Mm. There's nothing wrong with being a spade. You know, so when I go and say something like, oh, Bitcoin's a counter trade object, like that's fine. Like there's nothing wrong with that. That's right. useful, right? Like right. That, that could be useful the main people who like get antagonized by that who are, the, are those who engage in the sort of fantasy thought experiment of it being like a golden sword they're yeah. like no it's not a spade and they think <laughs> it's an insult it's like no it's just a, it's it's this thing that has a particular kind of structure and use and it's similar with like a lot of like alter, other alternatives you'd be like okay well what does this actually do like and the fact that i don't engage in the kind of speculative fantasy of it you know mm. um being something else is not an insult it's just a Mm. trying to take it seriously for what it is mm. yeah 
I agree with that. <laughs> Thanks, it's a. <laughs> I feel like I've been going in these long, like rambling rants. <laughs> Great, I love listening to those rants. Um, and we've been, um, yeah, quite a while, almost two hours now, <laughs> an hour right. forty-five. Um, so, yeah, any like last things you want to leave with people? Thank you so much for taking the time for the second time again. Yeah, cool. Uh, for talking to me, and yeah, I highly recommend people to read Brett's work. I have gained a lot from it. Um, and it's helped me a lot and sort of develop my own arguments and, and thinking around uh, cryptocurrency. So, yeah, yes, yeah, I, yeah. I'm, I'm in debt to you. <laughs> I'm at, and I'm, I, to, I'm at and, and I to you as well. And I to you. Um, no, I mean, the pod- podcast has been a great resource for many people, you know, so and also your book now as well. So, uh, thank you. Uh, but yeah, if my stuff, people want to like see more. There's my book, Cloud Money, which is actually mostly about the politics of cash versus digital money. It also does go into crypto a lot, but you know, it's it's about big tech meets big finance, basically. Mm. Um, so if you want to get a sort of insight into into that like battle going on right now, that's what. Um, but if you want my more kind of my work on alternative currency and stuff like that, uh, my Substack. Altered states of monetary consciousness, which is brettscott.substack.com, is the place to check out my more like esoteric musings, perhaps, and sort of <laughs> descriptions of money systems. Yeah, more metaphors to to be found. <laughs> yeah, like play with metaphors, see what's useful, what works, yeah, what doesn't. Yeah. Nice. Well, cool. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, thanks. Yeah, it's been cool. Thank you.